Bernie Moss has been teaching woodworking for over 20 years. He's come to regard the router as the ideal initiation to machine woodworking, and he's developed a number of simple devices to help him and his students to do standard operations, like splining, making mortise and tenon joints, sliding dovetails, and trimming end grain. That's why we've positioned him first in this tape on router technique. Let's begin with how he splines boards for glue up. You know, a lot of people recognize that the router is a very versatile tool for edge treatments. For instance, in this board, which is later going to become part of a panel, I've run a chamfer using a standard beveling bit. These bevels, when put together with other boards, form these V grooves, which when the entire panel becomes assembled, give me some strong vertical accents which are part of the overall design of the completed piece. However, the router is also a very useful tool for doing more than edge treatment. It can also do some sophisticated and complex joinery. For instance, in this desk which I've been making up for my daughter, I've used router joinery techniques almost exclusively. You see it in its half completed stage now because I'm going to be sharing some of these techniques with you. On this leg, I'll be demonstrating a couple of different mortising techniques. The top, with its large routed out section, is going to receive a slate insert a little bit later on. Now, the desk has been assembled with standard joinery techniques, however, made on the router. The top rail has been assembled to the legs by means of a sliding dovetail. The lower rail uses an everyday mortise and tenon. The center panel is housed with a stub tenon. And the very panel itself is put together using router techniques also. And that will be the first technique which I'll be showing you, is making up a panel similar to this one, which is presently in glue up stage. <laughs> The problem with gluing up a wide panel such as this, and particularly if the panel is long, is that under the gluing process, the boards like to bob up and down, particularly so if there's a slight bow in the boards. And in order to keep things lined up, a method that I found very successful is to use the spline method of edge treatment. Now to use the spline method of edge treatment uh, with a router, I use a slotting cutter. Now the slotting cutter is so positioned so that the distance from the base of the router to the center of the slotting cutter is approximately the same as the distance from the top of the board to the center of the edge of the board. Because the distance is only approximate, be sure to register the top of the board against the base of the router. And so that you don't make a mistake, make sure that the top of the board is plainly marked. Now, the second thing that must be regulated is the depth of cut that the slotting cutter makes. The ball bearing does not permit the slotting cutter to go any deeper than one half an inch. You may be wondering about this big wooden affair bolted to the base of the router. Well, the slotting cutter is an awfully dirty bit, and in order to keep my shop clean, I've built a special dust collector base. In fact, as you work with the router, you'll find yourself building special bases for yourself to suit special situations. Now. Before we continue, a few words about safety. First of all, don't plug in the machine until all the adjustments on the machine have been made and you're ready to begin work. Secondly, because the router is a terrific noise generator, you'll want to wear some kind of ear protection. Thirdly, eye protection is necessary. And lastly, for some operations that make the dust and chips fly, a dust mask is a necessity. Now, let's get to work. Moss uses this quick action clamping fence, which itself can be clamped to the bench, to secure stock of various widths where routing will be convenient. Before beginning to route, note how Moss, for safety and for accuracy, positions the router flat on the stock and lets the cutter get up to full speed before entering the wood. It's important that the router base be kept flat or the cutter will widen the slot loosening the splines fit.
The second board gets slotted the same as the first. Begin the cut about an inch in from the board's end and continue the slot for two to three inches. For longer boards, it's a good idea to mark on their faces where the slots are to be cut so that slots line up in adjacent boards. But for boards as short as this, eyeing into place is sufficient. Now that I've finished cutting the last pair of grooves for the splines, I can show you how I actually put the splines into the wood. Normally, of course, I'd be doing this with glue, but this is just to show you how the process is accomplished. These splines are just short pieces of wood with the grain running up, uh, opposing to the panel board's grain. Ordinarily, I would go and complete the other two joints by putting splines into them, but I just wanted to show you what a good method the splining treatment is for getting boards well aligned and nice and flat. I've just completed routing the groove that will house the stub ten on the panel. The next step would be to square off the ends as in this groove from the other leg. The whole process was accomplished with a plunge router. In the plunge router, the bit is registered uh, to the center of stock by means of a fence. Cuts are taken in a series of successive passes, and this is one of the finer points of the plunge router. You can go down a little bit at a time, lock it into place, go down a little bit more and lock it into place until finally you've achieved the full depth of cut. This allows you to cut vibration free and with great control. Now the next step will be to cut another complete standard mortise as appears in this leg, in this leg. Now the mortise is one half inch wide by a full three quarters of an inch deep and instead of using the same three eighth inch double fluted bit, I'm going to be using this spiral bit. The advantage of the spiral bit over the double fluted bit is that the spiral bit in a deep mortise will tend, because of the screw action of the bit, will tend to pull all the chips out of the hole. As you can see, the double fluted bit leaves a lot of chips inside of the groove. Now, while the router bit should be quite snug when you install it. It shouldn't be so snug that when you loosen the bits, you lose control of the wrenches and ding the post. Dinging the post interferes with the sliding mechanism. So while you tighten it, don't over torque it. Now it's important to remember that when you insert a bit, that that bit often vibrates under use. So that when you insert it, Make sure that you push the bit all the way up into the chuck and then withdraw it about a sixteenth of an inch. This is because as that vibration starts, a hammering action is set up. And that hammering action tends to loosen the bit, no matter how tightly that you've tightened it. So when you remember to insert the bit, bottom it out completely in that chuck and then draw it back a sixteenth of an inch. Tighten. Before I can start cutting, I'm going to have to adjust the depth. And that's what I'll be doing next. And the depth is set first by bottoming the bit against the stock. There are two methods of setting the depth. One is to place a scale next to the router's own integral scale. The second method is the feeler gauge method. Since the mortise will be exactly three quarters of an inch deep, I'll want to get a feeler gauge of the proper width. By luck, the scale is exactly the width which I need. I place the scale on top of one of the stops and drop the depth rod into position and lock it. Now I'm ready to do plunge routing into the mortise.
Having penciled in the mortise's position, Moss relies on his eye to start and stop the cut. The position of the bit and the width of the stock is regulated by the outrigged router fence. Here we can see the rhythm's characteristic of plunge router work, unlocking the body, lowering the bit, and relocking the body before proceeding with the cut. That bobble, by the way, is really to be avoided. The easiest way here would have been to add another piece of stock under the router base to widen the router stance. Now that demonstrates the advantage of using a spiral bit in a plunge router. Notice how clean that hole is. The next thing we'll be showing you is how we actually make the tenons that fit into both of these mortises. The stub tenon is produced by routing the shoulder first on one face of the panel, then the other. Because this is really two rabbits that yield a tongue, it's a rabbiting bit that Moss is using here. The first pass is done with the router bearing not quite contacting the panel end. This way, you can remove the bulk of the stock quickly and save the last pass for trimming. Notice how Moss stops short of the panel end, removes the cutter, and re-enters from the end in, thus avoiding split out. These burns, which are common on end grain, will not be visible in the assembled joint. I've just finished rabbiting stub tenons on the end of this panel. And the tool that I've used to do the stub tenons with is this plain everyday rabbiting bit. Now, usually rabbiting bits are thought of as being tools uh, to make recesses in order to insert plywood backs into cabinets. However, as you can see, the rabbiting bit also makes an excellent tenoning tool. Now, these stub tenons are meant to be housed in these grooves, which I've routed earlier in the desk legs. The small cheeks are going to be removed later by using a table saw. OK, the next phase of this operation will be to make a tenon in this lower rail, which will be a duplicate of the tenon in this lower rail. And to do that, I'll be using this jig. This particular jig consists of four parts two sides, which clamp the wood in place, an upper plate that both allows for adjustability and doubles as a template guide, a lower plate that supplements the clamping action of the side pieces. Now, the wood fits in here. Let me show you how it works. As with the stub tenon, this tenon is cut one side at a time. Only here, Moss is using a straight bit guided from above rather than a rabbiting bit guided by its bearing below. I've just finished routing half the tenon in the lower rail. Now this jig works in conjunction with the router's own template guide. The small rabbit-like recess acts as a template for the router's own template guide. The amount of recess of the rabbit is the difference in diameter between the template guide of the router and the router bit which I happen to be using. Notice how the template guide and rabbit allow the bit to move just so far into this jig. It barely grazes the surface. This same rabbit allows the template guide to be positioned so that the bit can cut the rear or shoulder of the tenon. Now, let's reposition the stock so that we can cut the second half of this joint. This jig is typical of the many mosses made in that it was conceived to answer a specific need and then universalized to accommodate other sizes of stock by assembling through slots rather than fixed points. Cutting a clean square shoulder is simply a matter of positioning the shoulder line right to the edge of the guide plate. These thumb screws press the stock flush against the underside of the plate and then the sides of the jig sandwich the stock securely into place. Watch here how Moss removes stock incrementally in both planes, moving in from the end toward the guide plate in successively deeper plunges. The final depth, which establishes the tenon's thickness, is fixed by the router's depth stop. 
To make sure your depth is right, you should either use scrap stock or try the cut on the end of the stock, both faces, and test fit the mortise. Tenons are commonly cut by hand or on the table saw or bandsaw. The advantage of the router is that it produces clean, flat surfaces and sharp, exact corners. Also, in this particular project, with six identical tenons to cut, a jig like this considerably speeds the operation. The aim here is to produce four shoulders in the same plane and the jig easily accommodates the stock in this orientation. Well, I've gotten all four sides of the tenon completed now on both ends. Now, we'll see if it fits. And that's not a bad fit. Now, the next order of business will be to make a sliding dovetail as in this leg in the other leg. The router is equipped with the same template guide, only this time the template is a slot and a piece of plywood. Moss uses a straight bit first because a dovetail bit under load often vibrates itself loose. So the bulk of the waste is excavated, once again in quarter inch increments, as if for an ordinary groove or mortise. In fact, this setup can be used to accomplish just this sort of mortise, or one not open-ended, especially easy to do with a plunge router. I've just finished hogging with a straight bit the slot that will become the dovetail mortise. The jig which I've used consists of three parts, two jaws which clamp into a standard woodworker's vise, a template which is fixed to those two jaws with four hanger bolts and four wing nuts. The center line of the template is positioned against the center line of the joint. In this instance, the joint is to be placed in the center of the stock. The business end of the template is this slot which is cut just wide enough to accommodate this template guide. It will allow the router to move back and forth without letting it wander from side to side. A similar template guide is mounted in the router right now. The next step is to choose a dovetail bit. And I have my choice of two half-inch bits that I could possibly use. One is a seven and a half degree bit, and the other is a 14 degree bit. Now, the seven and a half degree bit will have more strength in its neck, but the 14 degree bit will be more visual, and I think it would be better suited for this demonstration. With the 14 degree dovetail bit mounted and set to full depth of cut, Moss can finish the dovetail slot in one pass. Next, I'll be completing the dovetail tenon in this upper rail. I've just finished cutting one half of the sliding dovetail tenon. This fence, and this one is similar, rides up against this guide block here, allowing the bit to travel no further than the scribed line, which demarks the width of the dovetail. The stock is being clamped by this unit over here, and the clamping action is caused by two large wing nuts. The next step will be to remove the stock, turn it around, and get set to do the second half of this sliding dovetail. These two screws fit into these two taper fittings, allowing this registration block to be quickly snapped to the guide block surface. Now I can register the wood to the registration block. The surface of the stock is now flush with the surface of the guide block, and I'm ready to route. On thick stocks such as this, the final dovetail shape cannot be cut in one pass. The jig and router fence are set to control the final cut, yet they leave room for the dovetail bit to stay well clear of the scribe line.
depth of cut is reached in a series of plunges. The router fence away from the jig fence means that the bit is away from the scribe line. Once full shoulder depth is reached, passes now gradually approach the scribe line. Finally, with the router fence tight against the jig fence, one long, even pass leaves the surface of the dovetail clean, straight, and properly sized. Proper size, incidentally, is really a little loose. Sliding dovetails can offer a lot of friction, which can make for an anxious assembly. Well, let's see how it fits. Now, that's the fit I was aiming for. That protrusion will disappear when I cut the third shoulder later on. The third shoulder will be cut on the table saw or on the tenoning jig, which I've shown you earlier. The thing I'd like to share with you today is something that saved me an awful lot of grief and frustration, and that is trimming the ends of a wide and thick tabletop. The radial saw just isn't an answer. The throw of the blade just isn't long enough to make a smooth, complete cut. The table saw doesn't work either because the top is just too much of a bear to wrestle over that machine. Finally, after thinking about it for a while, I did come up with a solution, and the solution is to use this long, straight bit a bit that's long enough to tackle the thickness of the lumber. That bit, in conjunction with this straight edge router base, makes trimming the ends of this tabletop easy, simple, and pretty quick. Let me show you what I mean. The fence clamp to the stock is simply a straight edge, even simpler than the T-square illustrated in the booklet. The important thing here is that the fence is positioned so that the waste can be removed in a series of passes. The first passes are taken with the router base away from the fence. You're not interested in a smooth surface here, only the gradual removal of stock. The less stock you remove in each pass, the less of a problem vibration will be. Only when you have the smallest amount of material left do you take the final pass, running the router base tight against the fence. On wide tops like this, span no more than about 18 inches in each pass, always cutting from left to right. If you move from right to left, the bit tends to grab, and you'll have chip out and chatter marks. Notice the end blocks clamped across the width of the top. These prevent splintering as the bit enters and leaves the wood. Like many router operations, Knowing the proper feed rate is a matter of feel and sound. Chatter comes from feeding too quickly. This burn mark is the result of feeding too slowly. End grain is particularly prone to burning, but the marks can be easily removed. Simply loosen the fence, tap it back, and retighten. Remember to start the router clear of the stock and let it get up to speed before entering the wood. The final pass should be light, long, and even. Well, the desk is a little bit further along for the work that we've done together today. The top has been trimmed. The boards that we splined earlier today are drying in their clamps and awaiting further work. This panel is stub tenoned into the legs. The lower rail's mortise and tenon is on its way. And the sliding dovetail in the upper rail has been cut. I hope that these few minutes together have shown you that the router can be more than just an edge treatment tool, but that it can do a good deal of furniture work. <laughs>